Hey, let me tell you a few things about Rick Miller. Uh, I'm Ron Kincaid, the lead pastor here at Portland Community Church. I met Rick about 1998. My wife, Jory, was looking for a retirement home for her mother. And so Rick took them around, took them about six places around Portland. Only two were uh, Avermere. And, uh, and so I learned there that Rick is a very thoughtful man, kind. Um, five years ago when I told Rick I felt like God was leading me to start Portland Community Church, he said, well, Eric and I are going with you, and we will support you. And that they did. They gave us this property, the building on it, and a lot of money to remodel it. So look around. Do you like it? Uh, they're largely responsible for that. Four years ago, I began meeting with Rick in what's called a one-on-one -on -one discipleship relationship. We get together, we study the Bible, we uh, pray together for each other, and um, you can't, you can only get close in a, with somebody in, a, in that kind of a relationship. And I learned his love for Erica and their six children, and uh, yeah, he would do anything for, for any of his kids. <clears throat> He came on our board, I think, three years ago, and has been a very big help to the board here. Uh, he has an unusually keen business sense. Twenty years ago, he started Avamir with nothing. And uh, their main, one of their main missions is to keep seniors out of hospitals and nursing homes as long as practical. And uh, so they have a big home health care division. Um, and now it's built up to you know, 9,000 employees in 10 states. But most importantly of all, uh, about six years ago, Rick and I went water skiing. I thought, well, let's start with two skis. So put him on two skis. We tried, we tried, tried, couldn't get him up. So then I said, well, come on back. I think we got something else. So we got these two 80-foot skis, you know, and we got him on those, boom, popped right up. And I'll tell you today, Rick is an expert Slalom, slalom, that means one ski, slalom skier, and he has perfect form. So, Rick Miller, come on up here. Thank you, brother. Okay, can everybody hear me okay? All right. So, I know most everybody here today, so we probably don't have to go through the formalities of the typical questions of how tall that guy is, seven feet. How much does he weigh? 200 and maybe 70 pounds. How big is his shoes? 17 or 18. I was less than seven pounds when I was born. My mother is here today. She'll tell you that. And I uh, am a, uh, not a very good basketball player. So now, we, now that we've dispensed of that stuff, we can move on to something more meaningful. I want to explore this, uh, this morning with you this concept of generosity. And uh, talk about, uh, you know, what does it mean to be generous? And can we measure generosity? Like most everything, the answer lies in perspective. If you believe that everything you have in this world belongs to you because you've worked hard and given, you've self-sacrificed, then maybe this morning you should start off with a question like, how much of my worldly possessions should I give back to God? However, if you believe that everything belongs to God to begin with, and that he is particularly responsible, primarily responsible, for our success, then I think there's a different question to begin with uh, this morning, and that is, how much of God's blessings should we use to keep for ourselves in our life? These are two very different perspectives that I want to talk about and explore today. The first, beginning with, that all worldly possessions belong to you. The second assumes that everything already belongs to God. Depending on your perspective, these lead to two altogether different definitions and measures of generosity. So let's begin with the basics, the dictionary. Webster's defines generosity as showing a readiness to give more of something as money or time than is strictly necessary or expected. So how do we know if we're giving enough? How do we know how much God thinks is necessary to give? 
What are his expectations of us relative to generosity? Let's start with the Old Testament. Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 14.22, God says, Be sure to set aside a tenth of all that your fields produce each year. Okay, I get that. That means that 10% of everything that we make, we're to give back to God. That seems simple. It's tithing. But is it really that simple? First question that comes to mind, 10% of gross income or 10% of net? So if you make 50000 a year, does that mean you're supposed to give 5000 back that year to God? Or if you say you're in the 30% tax bracket, that leaves you 35000 or 10% of that, 3500 to give to God. Then there's more. The Old Testament law actually required multiple tithes. One for the Levites, the ministers. One for the use of the temple, the church. And one for the poor. So that'd be like 10% for Ron, 10% for Portland Community Church, and then 10% for the poor and the needy. Ron, what do you think of that? Okay. <laughs> All together, that'd be 30%. So instead of 3,500 uh, 3, to 5,000 a year, now you're talking about somewhere in the range of ten to $15,000. That's a lot. Or is it? It all gets back to perspective. Again, if we begin with the premise that everything belongs to God, what we're talking about then, that means that we're keeping 70% of what is God's for ourselves. You see the difference? The first is we give 30% of what belongs to us back to God. The second is, we keep 70% of what is already God's for ourselves. God warns us about money. In Ecclesiastes 5, he says, whoever loves money never has enough, and whoever loves wealth is never, never satisfied with their income. Do you know folks that have an abundance, a seeming abundance of things in their life, an abundance in life, yet don't seem really happy? I do. I don't want to confuse the subject further, but Jesus in the New Testament never defines a percentage of income that a person should give. He says only that we are to give, quote, in keeping in income, unquote. 1 Corinthians. Okay, so what does that mean? The 10% thing was easy. It's gotten a little more difficult to understand. So let's dig a little further. I'd like you to read along with me, Mark 12 here. Uh, so, Jesus sat down opposite the place, join along, where the offerings were put and watched the crowd putting their money into the temple treasury. Many rich people threw in large amounts, but a poor widow came and put in two very small copper coins, worth only a few cents. Calling his disciples to him, Jesus said, Truly I tell you, this poor widow has put more into the treasury than all the others. They all gave out of their wealth, but she, out of her poverty, put in everything, all she had to live on. So let's reflect on that a minute. This lady, elderly lady, very poor, shows up and gives absolutely everything that she has. I believe that her perspective was that everything belongs to God. So if you read along with me further, 
Uh, Matthew 19. Just then a man came up to Jesus and asked, Teacher, what good things must I do to get eternal life? Jesus answered, If you want to be perfect, go, sell your possessions and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. So I'm not sure that the literal interpretation of these verses mean that Jesus wants us to give up everything that we own and end up in abject poverty. I don't think that's the message. That said, he does seem to be suggesting that maybe 10% isn't the right number. So let's keep learning. Maybe this next verse will be a little more palatable. Uh, In 2 Corinthians, we're told that each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. So that seems pretty straightforward. God here is just saying, look, give what feels right to you. Like God, Jesus also warns us about money and our attitude about worldly possessions. In 1 Timothy 6, he says, For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money, some people eager for money, have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. Then again in Matthew 6, No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Okay, so at this point, at least I'm beginning to question my definition of generosity, particularly the spiritual impact of my perspective about worldly possessions. So let's look a little further, and let's look at the actions of God and Jesus, and how they've shown us generosity. So let's start and read along with me, John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Okay, let's think about that for a minute. Can you imagine giving up your one and only Son? I got to tell you, I fret over giving of material possessions. And here we have God giving up his one and only son. And he knew, he knew that his son's life was going to be a real struggle. And he knew that in the end, his son's death was going to be grueling, brutal, and painful. Let's turn to Jesus for a moment. We all know what he did for us. Now, if this picture offends anybody, just, I would suggest you put your head down for a minute. But when I was going through the uh, pictures of the crucifixion, I felt that this picture most accurately portrayed Jesus' sacrificial gift for us. He was jailed, he was judged. He was stripped of all dignity. He was mocked and he was spit on. And then he was crucified. He experienced hours of agony. Struggled with pain. When you're crucified, your muscles give out and you struggle for every breath. He gave the ultimate sacrificial gift to those he loved. And that's to us. And he gave his life so that we could be saved. And I can tell you, I don't deserve that. So, do I do enough for others? Obviously not yet. I'll tell you today, there are some things that I'm embarrassed of. I'm afraid to give too much away. 
I'm, embar- I'm, I'm afraid because of what money and worldly possessions have meant to me. I thought that somehow having more money, more time, more dumb things in this world would make me a little more desirable. Maybe a little more important in this world. I believed wrongly that having more has kept me safe from not having enough. By enough, I mean just all that I need in life. I've been wrong. I'll also admit, I've worried too much about the wrong things. I've worried about how much to leave for my kids and my family. I don't think God really cares how much I leave for my family from a financial perspective. While preparing this sermon, I gotta tell you, I felt a real nudge. And what came to me was that I know now that these kind of worries have been misguided. The right perspective, in my opinion today, is, am I giving enough of myself to be the spiritual leader for my family that they need me to be? I don't want my love for worldly possessions to get in the way of that ultimate priority in my life, the thing that God wants me to be, and that's my family spiritual leader. So, let's talk for a moment about how to give. We all have different gifts. We can all give differently, in different ways, and different amounts. Generosity doesn't just apply to money. We all have special and different God-given talents. If you read along with me in Romans 12, we have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it is serving, then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. If it is to encourage, then give encouragement. If it is giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. God wants us to discover and use his God-given talents for us. In 1 Peter, we're told that each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. There are a lot of examples of generous giving. Right here at Portland Community Church, I want to mention just a few of them. Mike Podranic, Podcranic, excuse me, Gail Clemens and, and Dan Chandler. Those three get up early every Saturday morning and uh, ma- uh, make breakfast for uh, what's called men's morning watch every Saturday. That's pretty generous. Terry Heinrich. Terry uh, does the janitorial services around here, and he does it all voluntarily. That's certainly an example of generous giving. Our kitchen staff, led by, led by Liz Utter. Look, every Sunday, they come in early. They prepare our meals. They serve us, and then they clean up voluntarily. Thank you to Liz and your team. That's certainly generous. Mark Haas, state senator, member of this church. Mark uses his God-given talents, and I would describe them as the ability to discern, the ability to communicate, and the ability to lead. Mark works tirelessly for us in Salem. And many times, that's a thankless job. And I know what Mark uh, gets paid as a state senator, and it's, he definitely doesn't do it for a paycheck. And Sam Miller is an elder here. Sam has committed a big part of his life to bringing the kids in this community through McKay, a school across the way, to Jesus. And with God's blessings, he's done a great job at that. really appreciate that kind of work. 
And of course, many have given generously financially to the church, and we thank you for that as well. Also, probably finally, I want to thank those that have given them of themselves and of their time. For what Ron talked about early, these, earlier, these one-on-one -on -one sessions, where for a year, people agree to meet on a weekly basis and use Ron's uh, and his team's study guide um, to uh, learn about each other, grow in our faith, and grow in our relationship with each other. Folks like Mark Haas, Ron Kincaid, Don Morissette, I want to thank you for being one-on-one -on -one partners with me for the last uh, several years. It's meaningful. It's a meaningful gift. Thank you. So back to the original question. Is what we give back really ours to begin with, or is it God's? In Genesis, we're told that God created everything. Well, if he created everything, it seems intuitive to me that he still owns everything, or everything belongs to him. In Deuteronomy 8, But remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the ability to produce wealth, and so confirms his covenant, which he swore to your ancestors as it is today. A couple of verses I'd like you to join me with again. 1 Corinthians, for who makes you different from anyone else? What do you have that you did not receive? And if you did receive it, why do you boast as though you did not? Do you know people who after achieving a little success like to pat themselves on the back and give themselves credit for that success? That really believe that that success is because of what they've done themselves? I do. I believe that success requires divine intervention, and we're kidding ourselves if we think otherwise. Without God, we have nothing, and we are nothing. I hope this is helping us gain a little different perspective of generosity. And a different, pers uh, yeah. It's helped me identify, certainly, my fundamental character flaw, and that's <clears throat> selfishness. Pardon me. I do think that everything does belong to God. So the last question I have is what am I and what are we going to do with all of his blessings? We have certainly heard a lot about revolutions in this country recently. Bernie Sanders, Hillary Clinton, Donald Trump, all have promised revolutions against the political establishment. Maybe we should have our own revolution. Not for political purposes, but for God purposes. And maybe that revolution should start right here at Portland Community Church. So what would a revolution here look like? Well, it certainly would start with us committing to exploring what our God-given talents are and applying those to commit to using our talents to serve God and to make this community and this state better in some small and some significant ways. It certainly means, a revolution means, that we stretch ourselves, that we step outside of our comfort zones and do things like witnessing our faith to others. That's a scary thing for me. Maybe devoting more time to reading and meeting with fellow members and friends, these one-on-one -on -one sessions. Having a revolution means taking more risk. It means being more selfless, giving more sacrificially. And it also means that we have to accept God's words and promise that he'll provide all that we need, and that is the absolute truth. He says in Proverbs 11, a generous person will prosper. Whoever refreshes others will be refreshed. And he also says in Proverbs 28, those who give to the poor will lack nothing, but those who close their eyes to them receive many curses. So this is what I'm asking for. This is what I want this morning. My challenge to you 
is to join me in this revolution. Let's give like we've never given before. Let's redefine generosity here. To look beyond the 10% limit that we typically apply as an acceptable level of giving, whether it's our time or our money or other talents. So read along one last time 2 Timothy with me. For this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. By now, it should be clear. Everything belongs to God. At least that's what I have come to learn through preparing for this uh, sermon. In our revolution, let's fan those flames. Let's, fl- let's, let's, let, let's fan those flames of generosity here. For those who choose to join us in 2017, my commitment for our part is that we will match every gift that is given to this church. Now, I'm not sure how we're going to do that yet. But, God willing, Eric and I will find a way. So join us. Let's have a revolution for God. I want to end today with a prayer. So if you'll bow your heads. Thank you for all of our blessings, Lord. We are rich in so many different ways. I guess it's easy to miss that. Thank you for our talents. We pray this morning that you nudge each of us to know that everything we have, money, talent, time, everything belongs to you. Let this newfound awareness lead to changes in our lives. Significant changes about how we see the world, how we see ourselves, how we see and value your gifts to help us understand clearly how you want us to apply our gifts to serve you, to make the world a little better. How much of your generosity do we really need in our lives? Let us use what is necessary and give the rest back to you. We pray that you move us and inspire us and guide us to become inspirational to others through our generosity. Let that generosity attract others to you, to this church. Remind us to trust you as we give more generously, Lord, as we keep less for ourselves. You know the devil wants us to be selfish and stingy and self-reliant, judgmental. Your desire for us, however, is to be selfless and generous and passionate about our talents, to lean on you, knowing you will provide all that we need. There are people in this world who never open a Bible, yet they are forming impressions about you, God, every time they meet a Christian, one of us. We may be the only Bible someone will ever read. Lord, let us become shining examples of your love and generosity. We pray for all of this in your name. Amen.